inequality bubbles and busts, why our economic system is not sustainable. What's on the agenda? Part one, how bubbles form. Part two, how to overcome them. First part, who's paying whom in everyday transactions? Let's take our daily bread. The price of each product and service that we buy is composed of two cost components, which is labor costs and capital costs. Let's take the farmer. He needs soil to grow the golden grain. Either he can rent the soil from a landlord, then he has to pay the rent, or he can buy the land with, a, with taking out a loan from an from investment bank, no, from a normal bank, so he has to pay interest, or he owns the land himself, but even then he has to calculate so-called imputed ownership costs because he could rent out the land or he could sell it. So whoever owns the land, um, you have to pay rent for just using it. The tractor or the seeds are capital goods. Here the same applies. Either he can take out a loan and pay interest to finance it, or he owns these capital goods. And then he has to calculate imputed ownership costs and his wage. So at the end of the day, if you buy a pound of golden grain for, let's say, two euros, this cost, which is contained the price in, within the price, is composed by these two components, late wage and uh, capital costs. The grain is being sent to the mill. They are the same applies to the baker. They all need land. They need capital goods, which can be financed by a bank or by equity, and the workforce. So, in the end, every product that we purchase, every service that we purchase, is, has a certain, certain percentage of capital payments in, contained in the price. The economic term for this is a rent payment, which means money is paid for something without having to work for it. And at this point, two questions arise. How much money is it and where does it flow to? Because all these daily transactions happen, if we know it or not, or if we want it or not, it just, just doesn't matter. How much money is it? Just some numbers for Germany. German government consultants estimate those rent payments in the form of interests, in the form of dividends, in the form of real estate rent payments to more than 500 billion euros per year in Germany. Consumer spending in Germany amounts to about 1,600, 1,700 billion euros. So about one third of the price of each product and service that we buy is made up by those capital costs. And where does all this money go to? Well, it's very simple, to the capital owners. And capital and wealth is distributed worldwide in a very unequal in a very unequal manner. For example, in Germany, 10% of the population own about 60% of net wealth. The top 1% of the population own one third of the net wealth. So what we see in everyday transactions is a perfectly silently and smoothly working wealth fee or wealth tax flowing from each individual to the capital owners. For example, if you buy a cappuccino here in the cafeteria for one euro, maybe one third of it, 30 cent, are capital costs. These capital costs flow to the top 20% of the population and 10 cent out of each euro flow to the top 1%. That's it. Many capital owners, maybe most capital owners, don't even know where their capital um, is invested. World, on a worldwide scale, Today, we have about $170 trillion assets under management. Those are numbers of Boston Consulting Group. So these, these huge assets are managed by professionals, like investment bankers, and you don't even know where this money is invested, where these capital revenues come from. The logical consequence of this hidden wealth fee or wealth tax is that automatically, inequality 
has to increase. And we can see these, this on a worldwide scale during the last one to two generations. Inequality of wealth, inequality of income increased worldwide. Right now, 62 persons in the world own as much as 50% of the world population. Just 62 persons. The top 1% of the world population own as much wealth, capital, as the rest 99% together. The economic, what are the economic impacts of this increasing inequality? Well, rich people save more than poor people. Because if you get, for example, 1 million euros per day on your bank account, you just can't spend that much money because you can't drive that many nice cars. So the, the savings rate of rich people is very high. And since inequality has been rising during the last one to two generations, the savings rate also has been increasing worldwide, whereas the median income, the mass incomes, lagged behind. These increasing savings worldwide led to a capital glut. I've been working in three banks until 2002, and in all three banks they told us, do something with all this capital that we have that we have taken in. So we have a capital glut seen during the last 20, 30 years. Low interest rates, which at first glance is very fine because we can invest. But what, what's the problem? We also can over-invest, we can overdo. For example, if people need homes and we build homes, invest in homes, that's fine. But if everyone has a home and we still invest, it's not fine. We form a bubble, we form sort of cancerous structure. One Spanish economist told, uh, said in 2008, we have a real estate cancer in Spain where two million homes are empty. The same applied to the United States where until 2007 many, many homes were built which no one actually needed. So we build up overcapacities, but this does not only apply to the real estate sector but also to the industrial sector and other, other branches. And also there we see large overcapacities. Some numbers for the United States. From 1978 to 2011, real US GDP, which means real US gross domestic product, the economic power of this country, increased from 100 to 173 after inflation. Those are numbers of the US Census Bureau. Those are government numbers. So we have a really strong economic growth during these 33 years. During the same period, median income rose by just 5% after inflation. What's median income? Median income is the income of the people who are in the very middle of the society, where half of society gets more and half of society earns less. So that's kind of an indicator for mass income in the United States. And actually, for nearly 30 years, mass income nearly did not increase in the United States. So if you compare these two numbers, you wonder who ate all those additional burgers? Who bought all those handhelds, all those cars, additional cars produced? Um, the, uh, the solution is that the people had not, not much more money in their wallets, on their bank accounts, but they took, took out uh, loans, for example, household loans during the last 30 years in the Western world increased six-fold. But mass production is only possible if we have mass consumption. Mass consumption is only possible if we have mass income, but mass income lagged behind a lot. And if we compare these two numbers, 173 over 105, we see that today we have huge overcapacities and these numbers apply nearly throughout the Western world, industrialized world. So let's say about three out of five production lines in the Western world would be sufficient to meet mass demand. So we have a very dangerous situation with huge overcapacities. And this situation resembles the situation of 1928, when after the Roaring Twenties, the Golden Twenties, we also had huge overcapacities and then the Great Depression set in. So just from a 
purely economic point of view, with far too much capacity. What's behind? How does this come? John Maynard Keynes, maybe the most famous economist in the world, in 1936 spoke of so-called functionless investor, who has just no function. The, and he said, these functionless investors are bad, are not only unjust, but they are also bad for the, uh, for the economic process. Let's have a look at the five, about 500 billion euros rent income in Germany. Where should this money flow? Well, it should flow to those who cannot work or who cannot afford to work. For example, to our children, or you, the students, or pupils, and, or to the senior citizens. There's where the money should flow, this rent income where you don't have to, pay, uh, you don't have to work for. But, and then the economic system, the economic process, the organi economic organism would be sound and could prosper. But one third of this blood, or one third of this Money flow does not flow in the social organism, in the economic organism, but flows to the bank accounts of very few people, and those people become fewer and fewer. And there, they don't know what to do with all this money. Rich people, um, they just invest in another investment opportunity, and another asset, and again another asset, and so some kind of cancer forms within our economy, within our social system. We have cancerous structures and huge overcapacities. So the argument runs as follows. We have a certain property property right rights in the Western world, which means we can we have no limit to capital accumulation. The sky is the limit and we believe firmly in X compound interest, which means interest on interest. And if you have just these two axioms, these two basic assumptions, automatically we'll see exponential growth of wealth, of capital. This exponential growth leads, must lead to economic, to increasing inequality. Increasing inequality leads to a rising savings rate, to a capital glut, capital flood. We see sinking interest rates, lots of investment, but mass incomes lag behind. We see asset bubbles, overcapacity, cancerous structures, debt overload, and then a sea correction will occur, maybe every 70 years, every two to three generations. So that's how bubble forms. What's the solution? It's very simple. The solution, the basic reason is the unchecked exponential function. We just have to skip, we just have to, to stop this, this unchecked exponential function. A death tax is not enough, progressive income tax isn't enough either. So we just have to abolish the hidden wealth fee, the hidden wealth tax in everyday transactions by giving back the money to where it comes from, to the normal people or to the low income people. So what we could do, for example, is introduce a property tax on real estate that's not used by the owner himself, be it a, uh, either he lives in his home or the farmer who cultivates his soil for, for let's say, 3% per year. We also could try a wealth tax on shares, on dividend incomes, for those who don't work in the company, for maybe also 3%, but that's dangerous, maybe capital will flee uh, in other places, we, that's difficult. And the third one, we should also eliminate the compound interest by introducing stamped money. But right now we have interest rates of nearly 0% in, in Europe and in the United States, though we could do this somewhat later. Take this money, give it to the low-income people, they will have more income, they will increase their demand and supply and demand will be a match again. The solution would be very, very simple. Or you just make a one-time wealth tax of maybe 30% for, for the top 5% of the population, and then all these troubles would be, would be resolved. I, the, 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 the clock doesn't work. I don't know when exactly I started. So what, can, what could be individual contributions? Well, Joseph Boy is a famous artist once said 90% of our products are either harmful or needless or unnecessary. So 
everyone could have a sort of a meditation about the statement, how can I do without needless goods and activities? Second, how to handle my assets if I have some money and give it to the bank for... Uh, they can ask, what is the bank doing with my deposited money? What does the bank invest in? Often we read, your money is working for you, or working hard for you, it's just untrue. It's always people who, who make me clothes, who give me my food, who give me shelter. So we can have a meditation about this uh, statement, man cannot live on money, you always live on the work of others. And the third one is to overcome claims, mindedness, egotism, self-interest. We could also have a sort of meditation about the, about the statement, all goods and services one makes use of, all work you evade brings about that all others have to work harder. And we have kind of a meditation about these three statements in the long run, maybe after 10 years, maybe after 20 years, we will change our behavior, we will change what we buy or what we don't buy, we will change our behavior, what we do with our money, and we'll change maybe even our jobs in some directions which, uh, which fits better to what we really want. So many revolutions were started by very, very few people. An avalanche always starts at the top with very few small stones, and then it runs down to the valley. Many, we have many grassroots movements today, so don't be afraid of the top 1% or maybe 0.1%. There's reason for hope we can change. Meanwhile, there's lots of, lot of literature on this topic. Thank you.